Transesophageal echocardiography was invented in the 70s. Quite clearly, if you have a transducer, why not put it on a gastroscopy unit and image the heart from the back? In the 80s, it became available as a clinical tool. And that's when I came to the clinic, actually. At that time, only a few people were allowed to use the probe. And at the beginning, there were not many indications. But as we went along, we created more and more indications. And now it's a standard tool that we cannot live without. However, the question remains, why do you want to swallow a probe to look at the heart? The answer is quite simple. Look at that chest x-ray and you will see that the esophagus is very close to many structures of the heart. And this allows us to use very high imaging frequency to provide images like these. Very, very high resolution of T probes is the main advantage. But this is not true for all structures of the heart. Only for those which lie very close to the esophagus. For example, the left atrium, the left atrial appendage, the aorta, the IVC, the SVC, the pulmonary artery, and of course for the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the interatrial septum. Let's take a look at some examples that highlight the advantages of TE. What we have here is the left atrial appendage, and right inside the left atrial appendage, we have a thrombus. You cannot see this from a transthoracic approach. This might be visible in a transthoracic approach, but never to its full extent. A large thrombus, which is peeking out of the left atrial appendage, actually. Probably a high risk of embolization. This is another advantage. We can see the aorta. A beautiful example of aortic dissection. And one of the major advantages of TE is to diagnose vegetations, in other words, endocarditis. This is a large mobile structure on a calcified aortic valve. TE has greatly expanded our diagnostic potential of diagnosing endocarditis. Valve morphology, we've seen in the previous chapters that we can diagnose a flare leaflet, but never as exact as we can with transesophageal echo. So looking at the mitral valve is one of the strengths of transesophageal echo. You can even see the eccentricity of this jet here, and T can help us in the quantification of MR severity. One can even generate images like these with the help of 3D TE echocardiography. Here on the left, you see a 3D image which we call the surgical view because we're looking at the mitral valve similar to the way a surgeon would see it. We see the protruding part of the posterior leaflet in a patient with mitral valve prolapse. We can even use contrast together with the TE exam and thereby document that this patient has an open patent foramen ovale. You can see the contrast passing from the right atrium into the left atrium. Color Doppler documents an atrial septal defect here. Again, left atrium, right atrium, and there's a shunt right between the both chambers. It also allows us to look at portions of the superior vena cava, which are very difficult to visualize from a transthoracic approach, and thereby it allows us to see a so-called sinus venosus defect. Here is the shunt right here, where the superior vena cava enters the right atrium. Sometimes we have surprising findings, as in this patient who has a central line and where a thrombus was attached to the central line, protruding here into the right atrium. One of the strengths of transesophageal echo is that we can look at tumors and masses. An example of a myxoma here seen on the interatrial septum. This is the left atrium, this is the right atrium, interatrial septum, and this is the mass. And it permits us to look at prosthetic valves, which are very difficult to image from the transthoracic approach because we have a lot of shadowing, as in the case of this mitral valve prosthesis. This is the part we do not see from a transthoracic approach, but if we perform a T, we see the left atrium very, very nicely, and that's where we have most of the pathologies. We'll talk about that in more detail when we come to TE.
But at this point, you can see that one of the leaflets is stuck here. This is prosthetic valve obstruction. There are many things we can see with transesophageal echo. I listed the indications on this chart. On the left are the various indications, on the right specific features of these indications. Just to highlight a few points. Some indications are very acute, in other words, very urgent, such as aortic syndromes or endocarditis, or maybe even prosthetic valve disease if we have an obstruction. Some indications are selective, where we are, for example, are trying to figure out what the mechanism or severity of MR is. And in some indications, we're bringing the TE not only to the cardiology department, but also to other areas, for example, the cath lab or to the operating theater. But TEE also has a few disadvantages. There are certain blind spots that you have to know. One is the problem of the aorta. There is one area where it's very difficult often to see the descending aorta right here in the middle part of the chest. And the other is the cranial portion of the ascending aorta and the aortic arch. Why is this so? Well, let's take a look at the heart. The problem is that we have the bronchial tree right here, which lies between the esophagus and the ascending aorta and the aortic arch. So this region here, which lies right here behind the bronchial tree of the ascending aorta and the aortic arch is very difficult to see. And then there's another blind spot. Not really a blind spot, but an area where we do not see so well, and that is the apex. There's two reasons for this. One problem is that from the esophageal probe, we're quite far away from the apex, which is right up here. And the other is that we sometimes have problems to orient our probe since we would cut through the heart in this way and not in this way so that we have foreshortening and the true apex is not visible on our image. This is why we cannot see apical thrombi or supraapical infarcts. Another problem are prosthetic valves. We also have artifacts here. In this case, shadowing of the left ventricle. And a mitral valve prosthesis can also shadow the aortic valve. And an aortic valve prosthesis can also shadow the distal parts of the aorta, or the aortic valve actually. So that is sometimes a bit of a problem. But if we combine transthoracic and transesophageal echo, then we can see both sides of the valve. I also don't like to look at the tricuspid valve with TE because I would say it's more difficult than from a TE approach. Of course, if it's the only option you have, then you have to assess the tricuspid valve also with TE. And there are several contraindications and problems that you can run into if you perform a TE. Don't perform a TE in patients who have a swallowing disorder which has not been clearly evaluated for its reason. Why? Because you can run into this. This is a diverticular, and imagine you push the probe down into this diverticular and you try to reach the stomach or lower parts of the esophagus. This is probably one of the most frequent causes of a perforation of the esophagus. And beware of patients who underwent radiation therapy because they could have obstruction of the esophagus as well. Furthermore, if patients have known esophageal varicosis, for example, in liver disease or in Mallory Weiss syndrome, you have to be careful because they could bleed. If we have the suspicion, we always perform a gastroscopy before because there we can see what the problem is before we enter it with our TE probe. If the degree of varicosis is more than 2B, then we would probably uh, refrain from performing a TE study. And if you perform a TE, you have to know what the difficult patients are. I tried to classify them, and the first category of patients are the so-called giraffes. Those are the patients with a very long neck, where the sphincter or the entry to the uh, esophagus is fairly far down. There you could easily lose control and you could come run into the recesses and thereby have problems in inducing the probe. The second are the young males. They're the ones who are usually most anxious. Now, we don't perform general anesthesia in the TEs that we perform. We only sedate the patient, so they're kind of wake. And if you give too much of that, that will make them even, I would say, more resistance to the introduction of the probe. And then they start grabbing your hand and start to do all sorts of things which make the introduction very, very difficult. The next are the stubby smokers. 
They're the ones who produce a lot of mucus and then they start coughing, which also makes it very uncomfortable, not only for the patient, but also for us. And then finally, we have the elderly patients with kyphosis and scoliosis, especially in the region of the neck. There we have a problem with the alignment of the esophagus. Sometimes we have to perform kind of all sorts of maneuvers, uh, S-shaped maneuvers to get inside where it is very difficult also to steer the probe. As a valuable tip, I can only recommend you to talk to the patient. That really calms them down and makes the introduction of the probe much, much easier. What are some of the problems that you can run into? First, dental injury. Second, submucosal hematoma. That occurs rather frequently. Jaw subluxation. Of course, this should not happen. Tonsillar bleeding. There you probably did a fairly forceful introduction already. And esophageal perforation, which is a rather rare but serious complication. Now, where could you perforate the esophagus? I already told you that one reason would be if you have a diverticula, but it's usually the areas of narrowing. And that is somewhere here in the cricopharyngeal area, where you have the thoracic vessels, or further down, where you have the esophageal sphincter. Another complication are bronchospasm and laryngospasm. Some patients just react very sensitive. You have to also be aware that this could be a reaction to the uh, lidocaine spray that you give the patients. Furthermore, accidental extubation. If you have a patient who is intubated uh, and you kind of um, pull on the uh, tubas instead of uh, the uh, TE probe, you would extubate them. Then sometimes we do see arrhythmias, bradycardia, because we uh, release a sort of a vagal reflex, which causes them maybe to even develop an AV block. Hypoxia, that's a complication you have to be aware of, especially in patients who already are hypoxic when we perform the TE. I'm thinking of maybe patients uh, with uh, right heart problems or with very poor left ventricle function. So those are the patients you have to be very, very cautious with. And then finally, all of these medication-related complications of, of whatever you give them to uh, put them under anesthesia. So far, I've been focusing more on patients who cardiologists investigate with the TE. But for some time, anesthesiologists have also discovered the TE. And the associations of the anesthesiologists have put forward a number of different indications where it is important for them. Here is a list to assess left ventricle function, both global and regionally, for neurosurgery to detection of air embolism, to detect pericardial effusion, especially in trauma patients, to look at right ventricle function, for example, in patients who are septic, to look at pulmonary embolism, hypovolemia, and to look at simple congenital defects. To give you a taste of what is important for anesthesiologists, here are a few images. This is a transgastric short axis view, as you will learn later. But in this view, anesthesiologists would look at left ventricle function. In this case, I guess you will agree that it is normal. This is not the case in this patient. Here is an example of a patient who has a pericardial effusion right here. You see the effusion around the heart right here. And here we have a patient with a rather large left atrium and poor left ventricle function. Both very important issues when it comes to assessing patients post-operatively. And here is a patient who was on the intensive care unit because he developed fever. Why? Because there's a structure here on the aortic valve. This is a vegetation. Here we have an example of endocarditis. And this is a patient that I will never forget. It was actually a young colleague of ours who practiced in a rural area of Austria, and he developed tonsillitis. He treated himself rather late with antibiotics. Then he was brought to an intensive care unit, and there they performed all sorts of tests, but did not perform an echo. He was then transferred to our department, and even there it took a few days until a TE was performed, and then we detected this massive endocarditis. The patient had staphylococcal endocarditis of the mitral valve with abscess formation and unfortunately, even though we rushed the patient to surgery, he died. And here is a pathology that not only cardiologists, but also anesthesiologists see very, very frequently, aortic valve stenosis.
And with TE, we're able to look at the morphology of the valve, and if we use Doppler, also assess the severity. Are you ready for your first transesophageal echo? Before we start, you need to know how to prepare the patient. First, we need to get written consent from the patients. So we have to explain him what the procedure is like and what the risks of the procedure are. Patients have to take out their false teeth. Then we prepare the medication. What we use is midazolam for sedation, and we use its antagonist, flumazenil, to antagonize in case we need to. Then we use lidocaine spray to anesthetize the pharynx, and we cover the transesophageal probe with a condom. Here you see how we rinse the probe, or that we fill the condom with a gel, which makes it easier to put the probe inside the condom. Before we perform a TE, we always perform a transthoracic echo. This speeds up a procedure because we know what we're looking for and we can focus on the things that we want to see only from a transesophageal approach. We use an ECG for digital storage of the images and also because we know what happens in which phase of the cardiac cycle. You see, in this case, we already perform a number of different measurements so that we don't have to do them from a transesophageal approach. Structures such as the tricuspid valve, we always try to evaluate from a transthoracic approach first, if possible, because it's not always as easy in a transesophageal echo. Here you see how we now anesthetize the pharynx. We give them plenty of lidocaine spray. We also put lidocaine gel on the probe itself. Not too much, but just enough so that the probe glides easy into the pharynx. Then we start the sedation. We use approximately two to five milliliters of midazolam, and then wait until the patients respond. Then we shield the probe with our fingers and gently introduce the probe while we ask the patient to breathe calmly and if necessary, to swallow. The patient is in a slight left lateral position. And you usually feel when the resistance is gone when you're in the esophagus. Now this is the phase which is probably the most uncomfortable for the patient. Once the probe is swallowed, it's easier for them. Never apply too much pressure because obviously this is what really causes complications or can cause complications. Now we've got the probe in place and as you see, we also shield the probe with a mouthpiece because those probes are quite expensive and you don't want the patients to bite on the probe. They're very sensitive to that. And then we simply perform the procedure again. We start with a four chamber view looking at the structures we need to see. We use the wheels to adjust the tip of the probe. We can do that in both antero or retro flexion and lateral and posterior. In addition, we use those buttons that help us to change the angle of the transducer on the tip of the probe. And then we rotate and turn the probe so that we see the structures which are necessary to see. In this case, the left atrial appendage. Usually we have a second operator who assists in pressing the buttons on the machine because it's uh, probably not the most hygienic thing to do is uh, to kind of uh, use the fingers that you are holding the probes with to touch the touch panel. So if you have someone aside or together with you doing the exam, that's usually very helpful. Of course, we use all the different modalities necessary. Here you see color Doppler being applied. You see we're rotating the probe and trying to acquire all the necessary views. Now, we usually don't perform all of the views which are possible, we focus on what is necessary and usually an exam takes no more than maybe five to seven minutes unless there's some pathology we're unclear with, uh, then of course it might take a little bit longer. But we're trying to reduce the discomfort of the patient as much as possible. But something we perform in every patient is a contrast exam. In our case we use oxypolygelatin, which is a, a colloid substance. We uh, put that into a syringe and we kind of pass it between two syringes to agitate it. Then we get a lot of bubbles. You see we've injected the contrast now. It's coming in through the SVC, gives us a lot of contrast, and this is how we would check for a patent for Amenovalin. 
This is a standard procedure we do in every patient. Just as we also look at the aorta, when we're finished with the exam, we would always retrieve the probe looking at the aorta, looking at all different sections. In this case, what we have here is a rather large plaque in the, probably in the aortic arch. Certainly, TE is done a little bit different in other labs, but in general, I guess this is the way you should go about. But now, let's go and see what the difference is between the way an anesthesiologist and a cardiologist introduces and performs a TE. Bruno, can you just shortly tell us what the differences are? Yeah, there are differences of uh, position sometimes, differences of place, and difference, uh, differences of patients, because of our patients are uh, very sedated, uh, sometimes uh, they have some muscle relaxation, uh, very often they have opioids, that means uh, they are very well sedated and they don't feel anything. In my experience, uh, because of uh, my training in uh, echocardiography, I was used to introduce the probe from this position, exactly behind the head of the patient. Because of normally my patients are in the operating room in this position, and our monitor is there, our monitor of uh, uh, ultrasound machine. So what I do, I take the probe, we can uh, move the tip of the probe in many directions, we can do anteflexion, retroflexion, and we can move the probe on the right and left side. That means it's very easy for the first anatomical curve of our patient to put the probe in something like anteflexion, something like this. Then I prefer to introduce the probe directly in the middle of the mouth of the patient. The problem is... Wait, Bruno, one question. Yeah. We always have the tubus in the way. How do you take care of that problem? Exactly. Our nurses know knows that normally, if we think that this is the tubus of the patient, we put the tubus on the right side of the mouth in this position, and it will be fixed here. That means we have a very, a very bright place to introduce the TEE. -E. Okay, what do we do? Uh, it's very helpful uh, during the uh, introduction of the probe that somebody hold the probe because of we, I can use both my hand with the mouth of the patients. So we perform a little bit of anteflexion, good, and we go inside. As soon as the tip of the probe is in the patient's, patient's mouth, I put my two finger here and uh, I try to elevate the chin. So when I do this movement, uh, my finger is like uh, a laryngoscope. That means I will help the introduction of the probe in this way, and then the probe is inside. I would suggest at the beginning to insert the probe, the TE probe, with the laryngoscope. You will minimize the damages of the pharynx. Uh, you can have some problems, especially in our patient, with coagulation, and could be very bad to have big lesions of the pharynx. For the normal patient, naturally, is a, a discomfort. After the examination, they will feel some pain. So um, this finger could help when you have some experience. Instead of this, you can use a normal laryngoscope. Let me ask another question. When I come to the OR, for example, or maybe uh, to the intensive care unit, patients have the probe inside for extended periods of time, hours even, days, years. Uh, <laughs> Is that something that you're concerned of? <laughs> nah. uh, na naturally, um, could be some problems when the interwelling time is very long. Uh, personally, I, I made a, a pilot study with the colleagues of cardiac surgery, and we performed gastroscopies uh, uh, after the introduction of the probe and uh, after the uh, throwing uh, out of the probe. And uh, we saw that uh, after seven hours, eight hours, a lot of patients uh, has uh, some small lesions of the pharynx and of the esophagus, uh, very seldom 
uh, it happens uh, in the gastric uh, uh, position. Uh, so, but anything serious uh, no, you worry about? Or? There were only erosion, uh, small hematomas, uh, and uh, they were big, uh, two, three millimeter, not, okay. uh, not very big. So nothing to really be concerned. Nein. So, um, no. And so when you have the probe inside, uh, then you're ready to go. One little tip that I would like to give you, this is something you have to be aware of. When you're then looking at the machine and trying to grab to the a transducer, watch out that you're not grabbing onto the tubus and pulling that out. This is something you certainly don't want to have. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to extubate uh, the patients uh, because of, uh, we will have other yes, problems. Other problem. Problem. <laughs> yes. problem. Okay, so this is uh, the introduction to the probe. We will then go to the different cut planes. We want to show you what you see when you have the probe inside.